So what's God, what's God up to in the world? What's his agenda? The Bible actually answers that question pretty clearly. And once we have a, a good feel for what the answer is for what God's up to, then we can ask this second question. What role do we play in that agenda? Because there ought to be a connection between those two things, right? If we can figure out what it is that God is doing, I, I, think, I, I think it would help us understand what it is that we're supposed to be doing. There, there ought to be a connection between those two things. And if we can figure out what it is that we're supposed to be doing, then we can answer this question of how do we go about doing that? The how point, the practical, everyday, nitty-gritty kind of question about how do we live for the mission that God has set us on track for, which is connected to his mission for the universe. And we're actually going to spend an entire uh, sermon series focusing on this question of how to live on mission. We're just going to call this series A Life on Mission. And for the next five or six or seven weeks, I don't know how long until I get tired of talking about it, we're going to talk about the, practic the practical, nitty-gritty, how do you live a life as a missionary or as a person who has a mission given to you by God. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about God's mission and our mission just to make sure that we got the fundamentals in place. It's stuff that we've actually talked about quite a bit, but just for the sake of entering into this sermon series and making sure we know where we're headed and what we're talking about, we want to set that foundation, make sure it's clear. I want to understand what God's mission is, I want to understand what, what our mission is and how those two things connect, and then we'll talk about now how do we live it out. The sermon series will focus mainly on that. Sound good? Today we're talking about God's mission, and we're talking about our mission as it connects to God's mission. Let me start with this. God is on a mission, and there are two aspects to it, as I understand it biblically. It's two sides of the same coin. I call it the revelation and the celebration of His glory. God is on a mission to reveal His glory, and the flip side of that coin is that he wants people to see and appreciate that revelation. Celebration. Does that make sense? The revelation of God's glory is the first half of what the mission of God consists of, as I understand it, biblically. I get that from places like Malachi 1, chapter 1, verse 11, which many of us are familiar with because we... I, I, cause I, I hit this so often. For from the rising of the sun, which is going to be over here, to its setting, from the east to the west, from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name, for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. God is on a mission to make his name great. Now, if, you, if we've gone through the getting centered materials with me before, I'd like to always compare this to um, Nike's agenda. What if Nike said, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of Nike will be great among the nations? Pretty intuitively, we would understand that they are on a mission for the sake of their fame. They want the name to be known. That is the first half of God's agenda. He wants his name to be famous. Habakkuk 2.14 says, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How much water covers the sea? Or how full of water is the sea? And I think the answer is something like, it's all the way full with water. So the earth will be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. The world will know of the glory of this God because he is on a mission to make sure that it happens. Now, the revelation of God's glory... Uh, is driving what God is doing in history. 
It drives his creation of the cosmos. So you read in Psalm 19, for example, the heavens declare the, the glory of God. The heavens are made to make a statement about God and how glorious He is. He is wonderfully glorious. And when you watch this week, the eclipse with glasses, hopefully, so you don't burn your eyeballs. When you watch this week, so check this out. I didn't know this. In, in the places right in that strip where it's going to actually be a full eclipse, the stars will come out. The crickets will start chirping. The birds will go into their night song. Because the, the, they'll be so confused by the wondrous cosmic event that is taking place. It is all declaring something wonderful and beautiful and glorious. Namely, that our God is excellent. So even the creation is participating in this agenda. When God rescues his people from Israel, from Egypt, pulls them out in the Exodus... He does it for the sake of his name. He does it so that his name might be known. When God brings his people in an act of judgment into exile and then rescues them out of exile in the Old Testament, he does it for the sake of his name. But there is one thing that God has done in history that is supremely revealing his glory more than any other point of revelation. And do you know what it is? It is the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Jesus Christ is the supreme point of the revelation of the glory of God in all of history to the point that the author of the book of Hebrews says he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of of his nature. There is no clearer point of display of our God than in Jesus Christ, to the point where, this is one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible, in John chapter 14, Jesus says to Philip, well, Philip says first to Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus says, Philip, have you been with me so long and you don't know who I am? If you've seen me, You've seen the Father. There is no clearer display. There is no clearer revelation of God's glory than Jesus. And so the sending of his Son is right in line with his agenda to reveal his glory. Now that's the first half of God's agenda in the world, is the revelation of his glory supremely on display in who? Jesus Christ. Now the other half, remember I said there are two halves to this mission, or two sides to the coin. The other half is that that display, God is, as though he were an artist, draws this display for us. He's using the creation. He's using his work of redemption in the Exodus, and he paints this picture for us by sending his son to us. It's not enough for the display to go forward. The artist wants it to be appreciated. There needs to be a revelation and there needs to be a celebration. So the psalmist says in Psalm 113.3, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. It's not just going to be on display, it's going to be praised. Actually, that's what Habakkuk said. As the waters fill the sea, there will also be a knowledge of the glory of the Lord, a knowledge of it, an awareness of it, an appreciation of it. And when you look at what, what is supposed to happen in the creature, the human creature, it's not enough to just give mental assent to the fact that God is great. God wants to create within us a heartfelt affection. The heart's got to be in it. Jesus said, if your heart's not in it, it doesn't count. And so Jesus says in Matthew 15, 
Verse 8, this people honors me with their lips. You see, they're giving lip service to this great, glorious God. They're saying that he's great. They're acknowledging the fact that he's great. He says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. God is after not only the revelation of his glory, but the heartfelt celebration of his glory. To show us Jesus and to make us worshipers in spirit. Not just truth. That's the mission of God. To reveal who he is so that he is famous. And to create praise within the hearts of people like you and I in this room. So that there's joy in who he is. That's God's mission. The fame of his name through his son. And the joy, the worshipful joy of people like you and me. Does that make sense? The mission of God. That's what he's up to. That gives meaning now to all things in the universe. Everything from creation. Suffering finds its meaning. What's God doing in suffering? He is on a mission to reveal the glory of who he is and cause joy in the heart. That's what he's after in suffering. Revelation and celebration. What's God up to when your schedule gets all screwed up? What's God up to when your day doesn't go as you were expecting? What's God up to when he does great things? What's God up to when there are bitter providence is in our life. It's always under the banner of this agenda, the revelation and the celebration of his glory. That's his mission, as I understand it biblically. Now, what's our mission? That is, how do we plug into that? Because actually, it's not supposed to be disconnected. They're supposed to be tightly connected to one another. We have a job. We have an assignment. The church is called to take part in that mission. And so we have tried to capture that with a couple of questions and answers that we use here at Choice City Church. We ask this question, why are we here? And the answer to that is, uh, well, it's not for some other purpose other than God's mission for the universe. It's not some alternative purpose. No, we answer the question like this, why are we here? We are here for the fame of Jesus and the joy of our city. That is to say, we are here for the purpose that drives God's agenda in the universe. That's why we exist. To pursue His mission. And in order to do that, we ask a second question. Okay, so what do we do? What are we going to do if we're going to participate in that mission? And we take our cues from the Lord Jesus, who gave us a very specific assignment. You can see it in the beginning of the book of Acts, where he says, I want you to be my witnesses, Acts 1.8. You can see it at the end of the book of Matthew, make disciples of all nations. For the sake of the fame of Jesus and the joy of our city, what do we do? And here's how we answer the question. We celebrate the gospel and we make disciples. That's what we do. That's the church's mission. And that's how we participate in God's mission. For the sake of the fame of Jesus and the joy of our city, we celebrate the gospel, the story about Jesus, and we make disciples, followers of him, who rejoice in the beautiful display of God revealed in his Son. That's why we're here. That's what we do. And, and, and in that way, we have kind of a big picture of God's mission and our mission. Does that make sense? That's all I'm trying to paint here is an understanding of what's God up to in the universe and how do we connect to it. And the answer is God is revealing his glory and creating celebration for his glory. And what do we do? Well, we pursue that by celebrating the gospel and making disciples. Does that make sense? That's why we're here. That's what we're doing. Now, 
In order, I'm going to kind of park here for the rest of our time. In order for our mission to be successful, in order for us to be people who celebrate the gospel and make disciples effectively, there are two things that we have to embrace. There are two things that we have to embrace. I can't even get into the rest of this sermon series the next five weeks or so until these two things are embraced. These are two things that are fundamental if this mission is going to be successful. We can't even talk about how to do it until these two things are happening. That's where I'm parking today. There are two things we have to embrace. How many things do we have to embrace? Two. two. Okay. Here's the first one. That you have to embrace if this mission is going to be a success. Number one, we have to know and embrace the gospel for ourselves. This mission will not be successful if we do not know and embrace the gospel for ourselves. Now, I know we talk about this quite a bit, but it's very important. There are a lot of people who go to church and say that they follow Jesus and claim to be Christians who do not know what the gospel is. They have a fundamental misunderstanding of the news that we proclaim as the good news. So I'm going to give you a few things today that the gospel is not. And I, want you to, I just want you to check yourself on this. I want to make sure that we understand what the gospel is and that we embrace it for ourselves because American churches are full of people that say they follow Jesus and they don't know his message. So I'm going to give you a few things that the gospel is not, and I want you to check yourself, and then I'll give you a few things that the gospel is. Okay, does that sound good? And we've got to embrace this for ourselves or we're, not, or we're going nowhere in terms of the mission, right? First thing that the gospel is not. The gospel is not a message about loving yourself better. The gospel is not a message about loving yourself better. That is to say, the gospel is not a message about having low self-esteem. Self-esteem is when you esteem yourself. Self-esteem is when you think highly of yourself and feel good about yourself because you're confident in who you are and you feel uh, highly valuable. The gospel does not promote that you should feel highly about yourself. In fact, the Bible says, oh, don't you worry about that. You think plenty highly of yourself. The Bible just calls it pride. The gospel is not a message about viewing yourself more highly. It's important for you to know that. We live in a society who thinks that is the cure to all of your social ills and your psychological ills, at least many of them, if, if you just thought more highly of yourself, if you just esteemed yourself more highly. Now, what I just got finished telling you is that God is on a mission that he would be esteemed more highly. Which means that a self-esteem gospel is in contradiction with the true gospel. Sorry. I know that's a shocker. It's just not the gospel. And it's important to know that. Here's the second thing the gospel is not. The gospel is not Jesus came to show you how to live. The gospel is not a message about how Jesus lived so that you can follow him as your example, merely. If you think of that as the gospel, let me tell you what trap you're in. You're in a performance trap. The gospel is not a message of, here's what a really good life looks like, now do it. That's performance, that's moralism. The gospel does not proclaim do a better job. That's not good news. For a guy like me, and people like you, that's bad news. Do a better job. Guess what? It'll never be good enough. It will never, ever, ever be good enough. That's not the gospel. 
The gospel is not a checklist of things that Jesus did that now you got to do. Now, that doesn't mean that the Bible doesn't promote holy living. It does, but we gotta, we got to get things in the right order. That's not the gospel. It's actually the law. And the law is not good news. Here's a third thing the gospel is not. The gospel is not, God loves you and has a plan for your life. Both of which, by the way, are true. God loves you and God does have a plan for your life. It's just not the gospel. There are a lot of people who hate the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Isn't that, it's right? Oprah probably believes that. And a lot of other people who would not align themselves with Jesus strictly believe that God loves you and has a plan for your life. There's something missing from that message. There's someone missing from that message, right? Who? Jesus is missing from that message. The gospel is a message that declares Jesus to us. And it declares who he is and what he's done and what it means and how you access those benefits. The gospel declares who Jesus is, what he's done, what it means, and how you access those benefits. It declares who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. He's not just merely a human. He is God with flesh on him. And he's a sinless man. He's the Son of David. He's the Messiah. The Gospel proclaims to us that this Jesus came. And it tells us what he did. He dies on the cross and takes upon himself the punishment that people like you and I deserve so that we don't have to endure that punishment. The, the gospel tells us that Jesus, when he was crucified on the cross, was paying for sins. Not sins that he had committed, but whose sins? Our sins. The gospel declares to us not only who Jesus is and what he's done, it declares to us what it means. Namely, that when this God-man came to the earth and died on the cross and took sins upon himself, it means your sins, my sins can be forgiven. That that, that, that was a sacrificial death and we don't have to have the judgment of God leaning on our lives anymore, that we are relieved from the judgment of God, our sins are forgiven, and we can now be brought into relationship with God, and we can be children of God, and we can be filled with the Spirit, and we can be with God forever, that the, the distance between us and God has been bridged by the work of Jesus on the cross. The gospel declares who Jesus is, it declares what Jesus has done, it declares what it all means, and then the gospel declares how you access it. The way that you access this, this forgiveness, the way that you access this relationship with God, the way that you access reconciliation, the way that you access the removal of judgment is not on the basis of anything that you can perform by virtue of your obedience. The way you access it is by turning from all attempts to please God with your own obedience, turning from that, and turning from all other treasures to the one true treasure, and receiving that gift of salvation by faith. That's how you receive it. It's a free gift. We have to know this gospel. For ourselves. We have to know who Jesus is. We have to know what he's done. We have to know what it means. And we have to know how to receive it. And we have to embrace that for ourselves. And if we never embrace that for ourselves, if that's never happened to you, if you've never tasted the 
wonders of this beautiful gift of God's grace in Jesus Christ, there is no way that you will be able to take the second step. Because remember I said there are, if this mission that, we're, that we've been given is going to succeed, we've got to embrace two things, right? There are two steps you're going to have to take. And the first one is you've got to receive the gospel for yourself. This message has to mean something for you. It has to be precious to you. It has to motivate your heart. It has to make you happy. It has to make you desire this God. It has to relieve you from your sense of guilt. It has to wash your conscience. It has to actually do something to you. Because if Jesus is not fresh in our sight, and if his grace is not fresh in our hearts, there's no way you're going to go to the second step. You'll find that there are too many other things that capture the attention of your heart. There are too many other necessary things. There are too many other desirable things that will eat up all your time, eat up all your attention. Do you know what people give their lives to? I'll tell you, 2015, Wall Street Journal released a study. Eight hours, 52 minutes of sleep and personal care, on average, per person per day. Almost nine hours of sleep and personal care. Now, I'm not condemning that. I'm just going to give you some statistics here on, uh, we've got to sleep, okay? <laughs> we've got to sleep. I'm just going to, I just want you to know what people tend to give their lives to. Nine hours a day to sleep and personal care, on average, in America. Unless you're between the ages of 15 and 24, then it's more like 10 hours and 24 minutes a day. Okay, a little bit more. Now, that totals over 26 years of your life. 24-hour days for 26 years you will be drooling <laughs> and unconscious. You give a big chunk of your life to that. Check this out. Full-time workers spend eight hours and eight minutes a day at work on the weekdays. Okay, so we're up to 17 hours on a weekday of your life, work and sleeping. Well, sleep and personal care, brush your teeth and stuff. If you have children under the age of 18, you will spend, on average, 1.5 hours now caring for the needs of others. Uh, if you've got a child under the age of 6, you can add 30 minutes to another hour to that time. You're looking at now, what, 17, 18, 19 hours of your day. Um, on top of that, Five hours and 13 minutes, this, this is now your full 24 hours, five hours and 13 minutes on average on leisure, which are things like television, exercise, uh, socializing. On average, uh, people will spend 11 years of their life watching television. 11 24-hour day years of their life watching TV on average. The average man will spend 11 months looking at women. If the, if the rates of pornography usage during the teen years were, up, were, were kept up throughout your life, you'd spend 10 months looking at porn. Three years washing clothes. Seven years lying awake. Now that's a waste of time. <laughs> Five months complaining. Four months shaving. Some of us more. Five years surfing the web. One year deciding what to wear. Now here's my point. It's easy to fill up the day. It's easy to fill up your life. And some of that stuff that you have to do, some of that, some of that stuff is just, are just choices. Some of them are bad choices. Some of them aren't necessarily bad choices, but perhaps excessive. And unless Jesus is more precious to you than anything, the day will fill up with everything 
but Jesus, right? We all know that. So if the gospel is not precious to you and has not hit your heart, how in the world are you going to move on to the next step, which is this? Here's the second thing that we're going to have to embrace. The first thing is that we have to embrace the gospel for ourselves. But if this mission is going to be successful, there's a second thing that you have to embrace, and it's this. We are the plan for the advancement of the mission. We, there is no plan B. We are the plan for the advancement of God's mission on the earth. We are missionaries. Now, when I say the word missionary, it's really easy to think of what? Some, somebody who goes overseas and kind of uh, maybe for a living, for a season, short term or long term, goes somewhere else and does professional Christian ministry. I don't want you to think that way. When I say missionary, I mean a person sent on a mission. You and I are missionaries. And what I mean by that is that we have a mission. We are the plan for God's advancement of his work here on the earth. We have a great sense of purpose. We're not just making our way through the dark here. We're not just meandering. We're not just wandering through this world. We are Christians. We have a job to do. We have a privileged calling. We ought to be driven people. We ought to be purposeful people. In fact, this mission or this, this, uh, this sense of mission identity is so fundamental to our identity as a Christian that the old English preacher Charles Spurgeon said, Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. It's fundamental to who we are as followers of Jesus. The people of our city need Jesus. And let's not assume that just because we're in the United States of America, that we are surrounded by people who understand who Jesus is. Let's not assume that just because we are in the United States of America, that the people in our churches all understand who Jesus is. Certainly people on the campus. I mean, if, and if, and if, if, if the disaster in Charlottesville doesn't speak to this, this is an opportunity to speak on this issue. A lot of the people who created the one-sided problem in Charlottesville, yes, that's a statement. A lot of the white supremacists who created the problem in Charlottesville claim to be Christians. And I just am going to go on record, not because it takes a real like big man to do this. It, it would have in the 60s. It doesn't take a big man to do this right now. Uh, white supremacy is anti-Christ and anti-gospel. Just, we just have to say that, okay? Um, now, the, the, bigger, the bigger statement is probably there's a lot of racism hidden in the hearts of all the people in this room still. That's a bigger statement, okay? myself included. That's harder, that's harder to say. Um, it's probably true. We don't know all the cracks and crevices of our hearts, and, and, and we don't realize how... how so many of our assumptions are very white. Just talk to somebody who's not and ask them if it feels very white. Now, what happened in Charlottesville is anti-Christ and it's anti-gospel by a bunch of people it's taking place in the lives of a bunch of people who thought, who, who claimed to be Christians. And I'm telling you, they just don't know that Jesus wasn't white. <laughs> it's antichrist. You could go back in his lineage. And not only is he thickly Jewish, <laughs> but Ruth was a Moabite. It's antichrist 
to, to claim white supremacy. And it's anti-gospel. Because the gospel declares that we are all at the same level of we haven't made it. There is no intrinsic great dignity before God because I'm white. That's crazy. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female. You don't have to be any of those things in particular in order to be an heir of the inheritance. Now, are there Jews and Greeks? Yes. Do we love that? Yeah, we love that. Are there male and female? Yeah. Do we love that? You bet we love that. We're just saying none of those are privileged positions that make you more in line with what God likes. I'll tell you what God likes. Jesus. And anyone who is in him. Male or female, white or black, Jew or Gentile, slave or free. Don't assume, don't assume that the people around us get the gospel. We still need to hear it. You know what? I was on campus the other day with Garrett and Tim and Amy and Lucia. And we were uh, at the Faith and Belief Fair at CSU. And it's kind of a chance where you can reach out to students who are, a lot of them are looking for a church. But we met one couple from China. They had never heard of church, the Bible, or Jesus ever. Never even heard of it. Here in Fort Collins. Our city really is, I mean, that's kind of an unusual, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's not going to be the status quo, but there are many who are just, who, who, who think that Jesus and his message is love yourself, or they think that Jesus and his message is that God loves you and has a good plan for your life, or they think that Jesus is saying, hey, live a better life. That's what most people think we believe, by the way. They think that we are moralists telling everybody to live a better life. That's not the gospel. Most people don't know what the gospel is. Who will tell this city about Jesus? Who will tell this city about the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? And the answer is, we will. We'll do that. That's our job. Our mission requires us to do that. Now, and I'm about to close here. We've actually talked about this missionary identity quite a bit this summer, haven't we? We've, we've talked about, especially as a church plan, how we are embracing this calling that we have to reach people who don't know Jesus. We're not mainly trying to recruit people to our church who are looking for a church, although, please, if you're looking for a church, join us and help us as we try to reach people who don't know Jesus. That's what church plants do. We've embraced that. We love that. We're going for it. We want to do it. But here's what's happened. I've noticed that as we talk about these things this morning, we talk about the mission of the church. I'm called to be a missionary. That we don't tend to have much of a problem with that. It's, I mean, it's undeniable, really, biblically. So we don't have a problem with that. The problem comes when we think of what it's actually going to look like to live like missionaries. That's where it's challenging for us. Because for a lot of reasons, we've got ideas in our minds that immediately race in that are probably uh, based on some, maybe some unhealthy things. You know, we hear, we're going to live like missionaries. Okay, we're a church plant. We've got to reach people who don't know Jesus. We've got to live like missionaries. So what that means, and here's where it comes into our mind, is crazy. I'm going to have to wear a sandwich board. I'm going to have to go to Old Town and do some open-air preaching on a pedestal. I'm going to do some door-to-door -door evangelism. I'm going to start a nonprofit organization and a food drive. And we're going to do a big tent revival. You know? And it's like, wow, that's not what we mean. That is not what it looks like to live like a missionary. At least that's not what I'm going to promote. And so for the rest of this sermon series, we're going to talk about what it looks like. 
How do we do this? We know what God's mission is. We know why we're here, and we know what we're supposed to be doing. How do we now live it out? What does it look like to live a life on mission? Does that sound like a good thing to talk about? I think it's really important. And I think it will be maybe different than what we fear. Um, and a lot of you are thinking, oh, God, I hope so. And I think, I think it is. So let's anticipate God doing great things through that. Sound good? God, we're grateful for our time this morning and for your